Welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have that a transaction has net cash flows of C sub zero, which is equal to negative five, C sub one, which is equal to 3.5, and C sub two, which is equal to four. And these cash flows are made at time zero, one, and two respectively. And we want to know what is the internal rate of return for this transaction. Okay, and so the first thing that I recommend that you do when you are working with a transaction with cash flows and you want to calculate the internal rate of return is to draw a timeline. And so in this case, we know we're working with three moments in time, time equals zero, time equals one, and time equals two. And so we will have a timeline that works with three dates, right? We'll have time equals zero, time equals one, and time equals two. Okay, and so then we know that at time equals zero, there is an initial investment of $5, right? That's what this negative sign means. A negative cash flow means that you are paying that money and not receiving it, all right? And so that is just an investment of $5, not a $5 that you are receiving. And so we will have negative five at time equals zero. And then at time equals one, we are receiving a payment. And so I'll write 3.5. And then at time equals two, we are receiving another payment of $4. And so we will write four at time equals two. Okay, and so what we wanna do is set up an equation of value for these cash flows. And so you could pick any moment in time that you want, but I am going to choose to value our equation of value at the end date at time equals two for this transaction. And so what I mean is that we will have that zero is equal to our initial investment of negative five, but then we want to value this at time equals two, and so we're going to want to multiply that amount by an accumulation factor to the power of two, right? And so if we do that, if we multiply by one plus i squared, that will value this payment at time equals zero at time equals two, right? It will bring it forward two time periods. And so then we can add that to 3.5, which is our next payment at time equals one, and that will be multiplied by the accumulation factor to the power of one, because we just need to value this payment one period in the future. And so we will multiply by one plus i to the power of one. And then we will add our final payment of four, which is valued at time equals two. And so we don't need to multiply that by anything because it is already valued at the moment in time where we are setting up our equation of value. Okay, and so now we have successfully set up our equation of value, and so now we are ready to solve for i, which is going to be our internal rate of return. And so in order to solve for that rate i, what we are going to do is set one plus i equal to another variable, right? And so what that will do is let us more easily see how we are going to solve this equation, because what we have here is a quadratic equation that we know how to solve. And so watch what happens if we let x be equal to one plus i, right? We're just introducing a new variable to make this equation a little bit simpler. And so we'll have that zero is equal to negative five times x squared plus 3.5 times x plus four. Right, we just replaced this one plus i and this one plus i with x, and so now we can see that we have this quadratic equation that we should know how to solve using the quadratic formula. Right, and so here's the quadratic formula. We know that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, where a, b, and c correspond to the coefficients of our terms in our quadratic equation. Right, a is the coefficient of our x squared term, b is the coefficient of our x to the first power term, and c is just the value of our last term that doesn't have a variable multiplied by it. Okay, and so in this case, a is negative five, b is 3.5, and c is four. And so we will have that x is equal to negative 3.5 plus or minus the square root of 3.5 squared minus four times negative five times four divided by two times negative five. And so if you plug this into your calculator, you will get two different values of x because of this plus or minus. And so what you'll find is that x is equal to negative 0.6104 and some more decimals, or x is equal to 1.3104 and some more decimals. And so just a little tip, when you solve for x, you are most likely not going to use the negative value of x because when you use that value, 
in this equation right here to solve for the interest rate, you're gonna be subtracting one to solve for i, and so if you're subtracting one from a negative value, you're going to have a negative value for your interest rate, and we're not looking to solve for a negative interest rate, we want a positive interest rate, and so it's going to make more sense to use the positive value of x, right? And so in this case, we're not going to use this value of x, we are going to use this value right here, and so if we plug this value of x into what we set it equal to to solve for i, the internal rate of return, we will have that 1.3104 is equal to one plus i, and so if we subtract one from both sides of the equation, we will find that i is equal to 0.3104, and we'll round it off there, and that will be the internal rate of return for this scenario. All right, and so that is the method that we will use to calculate the internal rate of return by hand when we only have three cash flows. Once you have more than three cash flows, you are most likely going to want to use a financial calculator to solve for the internal rate of return because otherwise it's going to be really hard to do by hand because we won't have a nice formula like the quadratic formula to help us solve for that rate. Okay, so our next example is also going to involve three cash flows, but if you're looking for an example where we have more than that, you can look for our video on how to use a financial calculator for various scenarios in financial mathematics that will be available at some point in the future. And when that video is available, I'll have it linked in the description of this video. Okay, but until then, let's look at one more example of calculating the internal rate of return for a scenario where we have three cash flows. Okay, so here's our second example. We have that an investor is asked to invest $12,000 and is promised in return a payment of $6,000 in one year and $6,500 in the second year. Find the investor's internal rate of return. Okay, and so we have three different cash flows in this problem. We have one cash flow out of $12,000, right? That is the amount that the investor is investing, and so he is making that payment. And then the other two cash flows are cash flows in because he will be receiving these payments, right? He has promised in return a payment of 6,000 in one year and 6,500 in the second year, all right? And so let's draw a timeline for this scenario here. Once again, we will have three specific dates of interest. We'll have time equals zero, time equals one, and time equals two. And we're going to say at time equals zero, that is when the investor is investing that $12,000 amount. And so that is going to be a negative 12,000 at that particular moment in time. I made it negative because that money is leaving his account, right? The investor is investing that $12,000. He is not receiving it. So that is going to be a negative amount. Okay, but then at time equals one, or one year in the future, he is going to get a payment of $6,000, and so we will have positive 6,000, and then in the second year, time equals two, he will receive a payment of $6,500, and so we will have 6,500. All right, and so now let's set up our equation of value. Once again, I am going to value this equation at time equals two, the end date for this transaction. And so we'll have that zero is equal to that initial investment of $12,000, but that's going to be negative. So we'll have 12,000, but it's negative. And we need to value that at time equals two. And so we need to multiply it by the accumulation factor squared, and that will bring it forward two years. And so we'll have times one plus I squared. And then we will add that to the second cash flow or the payment received of $6,000 in year one and that will need to be brought forward one year in order to be valued at time equals two, and so we will have 6,000 times one plus i to the power of one, and then we will add our final cash flow of 6,500, and that will not be multiplied by anything because it is already valued at time equals two, right? That is when that payment is received. Okay, and so then to make this a little bit easier to work with, notice that each of these values is in the thousands. If we divide both sides of our equation by 1,000, that'll make this a little bit easier to work with. And so what we'll have is that zero is equal to negative 12 times one plus i squared plus six times one plus i plus 6.5, right? We just divided all the terms on both sides of the equation by 1,000, and so now we have a simpler equation to work with, and just note that when you divide zero by 1,000, of course, that is just zero. All right, and so now in this case, once again, let's let x 
be equal to one plus i, and then what we'll find is that zero is equal to negative 12 times x squared plus six x plus 6.5. All right, and so now we can solve for x in this equation by using the quadratic formula, but just note that if you were to have a nicer quadratic equation than what we have right here, right, if you notice that you can easily factor this quadratic equation, you should go for it, right? Just factor it if you notice that you can, but if you can't or you don't know how to factor it, like in this case, I don't think we can factor this just because of that 6.5, that would make things pretty messy. You can just resort back to the quadratic formula and you are guaranteed to get a value of x that is going to help you find the internal rate of return. And so once again, here's the quadratic formula. In this case, a is equal to negative 12, b is equal to six, and c is equal to 6.5. And so we will have that x is equal to negative six plus or minus the square root of six squared minus four times negative 12 times 6.5, all divided by two times negative 12. Okay, and so then if you plug this into your calculator, you will get two different values for x. You will find that x is equal to negative 0.527 and some more decimals, and that x is equal to 1.027 and some more decimals as well. But remember, we're not going to be interested in using the negative value of x. We want to use the positive value of x. And so if we clean up our work here, we can use this value of x to solve for the internal rate of return by plugging what we know x is equal to into this equation, right? We said that x is equal to one plus i. And so if we do that over here, we will have that 1.027 and some more decimals is equal to one plus i. And so if we subtract this one from both sides, we will find that i is equal to 0.027 and some more decimals, but I'll round it off there. And so that will be the investor's internal rate of return in this scenario. All right, and so that is all I had for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.